everybody. Yeah, today is a day of celebration. A day where we celebrate what God has done for us in sending his son to die for us. And today is the day that he rose again. So there's an old tradition that goes something like this. I say he is risen and you respond with a loud voice. He is risen indeed. Let's try that. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Let's try that again. He is risen. He is risen All right. Well, we're going to begin our time of worship together singing some songs. And this first song is one from way back. Lord, I lift your name on high. Maybe you know it. I want to invite you to lift your voice and sing and praise God with us.
she gave Your body was broken Your love poured out You bled and you died for me There on the cross You breathed your last as you were crucified You gave it all Thank you. 
when the lights went out When death had claimed its victory The king of love had given up his life The darkest day in history They made for sinners For every curse His blood atoned One final breath And it was finished But not the end We could have known For the earth began to shake And the veil Sacrifice was made as the heaven roared. All hail, King Jesus! All hail, the Lord of heaven and earth! All hail, King Jesus!
may have noticed that you have a sheet of paper with some lyrics on it. This song that we're going to do next was a song that the Lord inspired our worship team and our lead pastor to write for this season. We're in a season called Cross Equals Love. And this is a prayer and a testimony. It can be personal, but it's more of a universal message about our journey and our vision, how we saw Jesus ultimately culminating in victory. And when we sing this song, this is the voice of our community here at Desert Vineyard. I invite you to enter in as we sing this song, Victory Is Your Name. Rising, shouting victory. 
thank you for what you've done for us. The ultimate sacrifice in giving your life for us. That we may have life and life more abundantly. And our response is we won't be quiet. We'll sing out your praise. Thank you for saving us, Lord. We glorify you and we praise you for who you are. And it's in your strong name we pray and praise. Welcome everyone, my name is Audra, I'm one of the pastors here, and we're just so glad that you have chosen to be with us this Easter morning. We're so glad you're here. Uh, We're gonna move right into our time of giving right now. This is another way that we get to worship God with all that we are and all that we have. And so I'm gonna invite the serve team forward. I'm gonna pray for that. Lord God, we do want to give more and more of ourselves to you who gave it all for us. And so to the degree that we understand that, we want to be giving ourselves over to you. We offer ourselves to you now this morning. God, our hearts, our minds, our spirits, our bodies, and our finances. We pray that you will have your way in all these things. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I just want to say welcome if you're new or visiting. Uh, Easter is a day that some people get dragged into church, and we're glad you're here too. And uh, maybe you're exploring church, and Easter seems like the right time to kind of feel that out and do that. Well, we've been planning for you to be here, however you came this morning. And we've put these welcome cards in your seats. We'd love for you to take a hold of that, fill it out if you would be so brave, because we want to meet you. We want to learn a little bit about you. And our congregation has been buying these Cross Equals Love t-shirts so that we would have t-shirts ready for you when you came to see us for the first time. So if you would take this card out into the lobby after service, we would love to meet you face to face, get to know you a little bit better, and put a t-shirt in your hands so that you feel like you get to belong with us right from day one. If you are rejoining us maybe for the first time in a while, you can also fill this out and put your information in there so that we can update that and you can reconnect as well. And then there's prayer requests on the back if that's something you could use. So um, yeah, I just wanna say welcome again and I wanna give you guys the opportunity to welcome one another. So would you get up and say hi to one another? And if you've joined us online this morning, I just want to say welcome to you as well. Would you say hi to one another in that chat? And then Pastor Nathan's going to be up in just a minute. Welcome everyone. So glad you are here. My name is Nathan and I'm the lead pastor. And it is, hello, it's good to see you. I'm so glad you have chosen to join us. And uh, I am so excited to share what God has been laying on our hearts for you today. But I wanted, in case you didn't hear, we do a little bit of a traditional thing. 
that's been happening in Christian churches for a while, where the person up front says, he is risen, and everyone responds, he is risen indeed. So I want to give you a chance to practice that. It's a good time. Ready? So, he is risen. He is risen indeed. Okay. I'm not going to say that the wings need a little more vocal, but we'll, we'll try it again. Ready? He is risen. He is risen indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Now, that song we just sang uh, was beautiful, and um, we were able to put it together as a team, and it, it definitely was a dream of mine. I am not as vocally gifted as, as most people are, uh, and, but I love worship music. And so we've been able to write this together with many people, and it's, it's a bit of a dream for me uh, to be able to do that. So that was kind of a moment for me right there. <laughs> it was pretty exciting to watch that and to be part of these talented individuals who God has laid such a powerful gift on their hearts of writing music and to be well, counted amongst them is, is such an honor. And today, uh, I, I want to walk through Isaiah 53, through the song, as we prepare for this moment where we're celebrating the resurrection of Jesus. Uh, it was written about Isaiah 53. We got together and said, this series, Cross Equals Love, means something to us, so can we as a community express something? And, and I thought that we did, and I'm very excited about it. Today, we're going to walk through some biographies of Jesus. There are four of them in the New Testament. And we're going to walk through them as we kind of step back to Good Friday for a moment so that we can step fully into Resurrection Sunday. I'm so glad that you are here. And if you are new, um, welcome. We had about 300 people come to our uh, sunrise service that didn't get rain on you. And they were the most awake group of people. I'm serious. They were like, woo! They made this row a run for their money for their excitement level. You know what I'm talking about if you're part of the 9 a.m. Um, if you're online, I'm just so glad you're here to share with you as well. We're going to dive right in. There's a lot of scripture. They're going to be on the screens. They're also in your notes as well as the lyrics that we'll go through today as well. Um, but I want to start off in John 19, verse 1. That's going to get heavy real quick. So Pilate then took Jesus... And had him flogged. And the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and placed it on his head, put a purple cloak on him. And they repeatedly came up to him and said, Hail, King of the Jews, and slapped him in the face again and again. Jesus was despised by the people, abandoned by his disciples. He was a man who was at the moment experiencing great pain, but also had suffered and was familiar with sickness. People hid from him. He was despised. And at the end, we all thought that he was worth nothing. Yeah. Jesus suffered incredible pain. And what we know is because Jesus experienced incredible suffering, he understands us. He understands the pain and the suffering that we go through. He wasn't a God who was far off, but close. But it didn't get better from there. Verse 17, moving on in John. They took Jesus, therefore, and he went out carrying his own cross to the place called the place of a skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, which means to, to stick nails, spikes through his hands and feet and hang him on a cross to suffocate and die. And with him, two other men, one on either side, Jesus in between. Now, Pilate wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It was written, Jesus the Nazarene, the king of the Jews. This was meant to be an insult. There's layers to it. The king of the Jews, the Romans, didn't want any kings but theirs. So saying, look, this is your king. This is what they were mad about. The Jewish people were mad. Hey, don't let him be called a king. The Romans used it to mock them. Say, look what kind of power your king has. And they put him on a cross. But they put on the Nazarene. That was an insult as well. They had a phrase back then. Can anything good come from Nazareth? And I was trying to think of an example and I, I, I uh, thought of a rivalry in football that I'm familiar with. I, I went to the Ohio State University, and we don't like Michigan. I don't know if you guys knew that. 
Like, we don't, we don't like one school in Michigan, but we have decided that the entire state is terrible. That's, it doesn't make sense, it just is. The week before the football game between the two, OSU will put red X's on every M in their entire little city campus. And I'm not kidding. There's an obsession. You can't say the word Michigan that week because that's bad luck. You have to use other derogatory terms. So the question is, can anything good come out of Michigan? Right? It, it's, it's ridiculous. Uh, but then God called me to serve in Michigan and showed me exactly what's up. I used to call it my Nazareth, right? My Nazareth, my the place that I would go to. Anyways, um, funny story. Funny enough, you know, we, we, like, I joke as if this didn't matter to me, but I actually lived uh, 30 minutes away from the University of Michigan where all of the sinners are. And <laughs> when my child uh, was set to be born in Michigan, which was already bad enough, we actually looked for hospitals that weren't the University of Michigan and made plans to make sure because darn it, if my kid would be born on that campus. And that's not actually a joke. That's how far my dysfunction goes as a pastor. Can anything good come from Nazareth? This is your king. And the song, the first lyrics is, we came to gaze upon your beauty to see your power on display. When we started writing this song, we, we want to talk about how often we come to Jesus with different expectation, ex expectations, worldly expectations. They wanted a king, a Messiah, who would come in and conquer, someone who was good looking, someone who had charisma, and what they got was a naked Jew on a cross who wasn't terribly good looking. He confused them. He confused the powers of the day. They didn't know what to do with him. And his death to his disciples, to the ones he loved, was a shock, a major disappointment. And they were ashamed. And the song continues, you did not meet our expectations. Our eyes are covered by shame. And there's two kind of layers to this last line covered by shame. The first is Jesus' shame. And what we saw was shameful hanging on the cross, like a, some kind of criminal, mocked and abused and naked, which was hard to even, it's, it's just shameful. As so we couldn't see what God was doing in that moment, they couldn't grasp what was happening because all they could see is how it showed up in a way that they couldn't accept. But there's another layer to it. Lee, who is on our security team, does an absolutely wonderful job. I, I brought the lyrics to our staff this week before they had heard the song just to get some reactions. And Lee said, you know, that line, our eyes are covered by your shame, by shame. And he says, you know, so often my shame blinds me to what God is doing. I, I can't see what he is doing because I'm so ashamed. And I know that's true for us if you came in here and you're struggling with some things from your past or some things maybe that happened this week and there's this that feeling of shame, like I am bad, I am not good enough. The hope of Jesus is that he comes in those moments and he shows his light and that he may want to open your eyes to his love for you today. My first line for you, my first point is Jesus isn't what you think he is. Jesus is often not what you think he is. He wasn't to anybody in that moment, even, even his mother. I can't imagine she understood what was happening in that moment. Let's continue on. But before we get there, I, I just want you to know, I, some of us have moments in our life just like the disciples might have had where they're looking up at Jesus and going, God, like this, what are you doing? Why the suffering? What's going on? You're, you're not showing up the way I expected you to. I have moments like that, some where I just say, God, I don't get it. In fact, to the core of myself, I, I, I kind of feel like God has failed me. And that's my human condition. So I want you to know that if you feel that way, if you feel that way, there's such a message of hope in Easter and that our expectations can be completely undone 
by who Jesus is. We're going to jump over to Mark 15. It's another biography talking about the same time. Those passing by, this is verse 29. Those passing by were hurling abuse at him, shaking their heads and saying, ha, you were going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days? Save yourself by coming down from the cross. Jesus had said that he was going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, and everyone thought that was ridiculous, and now they're using it against him. They're mocking him. But God wasn't talking about, Jesus wasn't talking about a building. He was talking about his body. And the people who are mocking him are watching his prophecy come to pass without understanding it, that he was tearing down the body, and three days later, which is today, he would bring it back. In the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes, were mocking him among themselves, saying, he saved others. He can't even save himself. What kind of place do you have to be to watch any human suffer like that and to talk like that? He cannot even save himself. Let this Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross so that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him were also insulting him. And what a perspective on that. There's two men on either side of Jesus. One, two. And they know that they have done wrong. And they're up there as much as any human deserves it. Those humans deserved it. It's a cruel punishment. But what does it take for those two people to actually be insulting the other one on the cross with them? This is powerful. As the song continues, it says, we rejected your majesty. We rejected what was happening in that moment. Think about it. The Jesus on the cross is a picture that has inspired hundreds, thousands, millions of peoples of years as a moment, one of sorrow, yes, but of, of power, of majesty. It meant something incredible. But to them, it looked like the end. We rejected this sacrifice. As the song continues, it says, we rejected the broken bread you gave. What we know is Jesus broke bread and said, this is my body broken for you. Eat this, receive this, do this in remembrance of me. And often back then and now we reject that, say, no, I don't want that sacrifice. It continues on, your power poured out through weakness displayed, the pouring out of his blood, of his life, death. The power of the blood of Jesus Christ spilt for us is more than we can ever understand. They didn't understand it in the moment. And, and I think for us, we often can misunderstand it as well. I want you to just look inward for a moment. And I'm talking about everybody in the room. Those of us who grew up in the faith, those of us who've come to the faith, been in the faith for years, those of us who aren't sure, I love this church, because all those people, all of us mingle together with people who aren't actually are kind of convinced Jesus isn't God. They're in the room because they sense something here. But let's look in for a moment and think about our lives. When we want Jesus to show up a certain way or we're struggling with our brokenness and our pain or our, our, our loss. As the song continues, it says, in our confusion, you have drawn near Jesus drew near to our suffering and to each one of us. And out of the dust, we see your light. Dust is this idea of death. Out of the death in our lives, we, we see the light of Jesus because he's overcome death show up. This next line, though, this one hits me. Shame and rejection we all feel. I, I feel rejection before even in the body of Christ. That feeling of aloneness and shock, you can almost feel it inside of your body. We know that God is with us in those moments. In fact, our hope is found in the darkest of nights. In church, and often, I hope you know if you haven't been here in a while or you've, you only come to church on Easter or Christmas, and that's fine too. Seriously, I, I'm just glad you're here. I love that you are here. We're waiting for you to be here. But there's this idea of church that we've got to like figure ourselves out, right? So that we can meet God. 
we got to be pure. we got to be holy. we got to be in a good place. Our relationship's got to be good, that kind of thing, you know. We can't have shown up to church with all this baggage. Now, this is not true. We want to be on the mountain when we're feeling good, on the mountaintop feeling good, just so full of joy, and we think that's the moment that Jesus will meet us. But in reality, God doesn't want to meet you on the mountaintop in the same way he wants to meet you in the darkest of dark places, in the valley, in your heart, in the places where you feel the greatest shame. Jesus' light can shine the strongest. God wants to meet us in those moments of confusion and death and shame and rejection and draw near to us. I want you to imagine this scene, this final scene on Friday, Mark 15, our third biography for today, verse 33. When the sixth hour came, darkness fell over the whole land until the ninth hour. At the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, Lema. Sabachthane, which is translated, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And when some of the bystanders heard him, they began saying, look, he's calling for Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a reed and gave him a drink saying, let us see if Elijah comes to take him down. And Jesus let out a loud cry and died. As the song continues, it says, there was a quiet. There was a silence that you say. Our hearts are broken. The very next verse says this. And the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who was standing right in front of him, right in front of Jesus, saw that he died in this way, he said, truly, this man was the son of God. These three verses right next to each other, I struggled with them at first. Like, what is happening in these three and it's important for us to pause here and realize something powerful is happening in this moment. First, Jesus let out a loud cry and died. And because of that, the veil in the temple was torn. Why is that important? The veil separated the unpure from the pure. It was the place that God's presence was, but you'd have to be on the other side. There were restrictions. You had to be of the right religion, do a certain practices, make sure you were pure, be the right gender, go into this place at only certain times. That's where the presence of God was. And when Jesus died, the veil split and there was no longer any separation from God's presence and his people. You understand that this is powerful. It's more powerful than you understand. It truly is. Now, the next verse, why is that there? This centurion, he didn't show up before. What's going on here? The centurion, right after the veil is torn, all of a sudden goes, that's God. How many centurions do you think, or how many men did that centurion see die? Probably, you know, 15 a week. He saw so many die, but he saw Jesus die and said, this is the son of God? Why did he get it when no one else did? Why? See, I think it's so powerful that the veil was torn. The centurion saw in that moment because the veil was torn and his eyes, the veil was lifted, he could see. See, I think that one of the most powerful things the cross did was open up the reality that God's presence could be amongst his, his people in a way that it wasn't before because of our sin, but there's still this choice that people need to make to follow Jesus, but I think that they could actually for the first time see who Jesus was because of the power of that sacrifice once and for all, for all of our trespasses, for all of our brokenness, for all of our suffering that we have caused other people in that moment, it is finished, not just for that time, but for all time. There's a power 
in these moments. So if we continue the point that I made, Jesus isn't what you think he is. He is always more. Jesus is always more. I don't care how you walked into this room. Jesus is more than you think he is. Always more. And it'll be our absolute joy to explore that for all of eternity. But what Jesus did on the cross is so much more. And so before I go any further, because we got to get into Easter. I know you're like, don't worry. It's not a whole other sermon on the other end of this. I want to get into Easter, but I, I can't go any further. Because there, there are people in this room. There were people this morning who said, uh, that's enough. I don't need to hear anymore. I'm ready to follow Jesus. And there, there's a moment where you got to choose. And this is your moment where the veil has been lifted from your eyes and you can see Jesus for who he is. And there's a choice to be made. And so we're going to pause for a moment and give space to that. I'm going to invite everybody to close their eyes, bow your head. And if today's the day that you have decided it's, it's time to follow Jesus, it's time. It's time to give my life over, I believe. I just want you to lift your hand. Just go ahead and lift it up. And I just want to pray for you. And you can pray this out loud or in your hearts, make this real for yourself. And just say something like this, God, I, I am broken. God, I need someone to, to rescue me. I believe that Jesus died to take on my sins, my brokenness. So today I choose to lay down my life and to follow yours. Make me clean. Make me new. Let the shame and brokenness and pain of years fall off in the presence of your love. Amen. It's a powerful moment. If you made that decision, we want to talk to you at the end. We want to pray for you. We want to get to know you. And you may even choose to get baptized in two weeks. Please come talk to us about that. There are quite a few hands. Don't leave here without being connected. We want to walk with you in the midst of this. And we could stop the service now, and it would be amazing. And Jesus could have stopped right there, but he didn't. He chose to do something more. There's always more. That wasn't the end. And Easter today is about what happens next. Matthew 28, they bury him in a tomb, and three days later, verse 1. Now after the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to look at the tomb. And behold, a severe earthquake had occurred, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat upon it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothing was as white as snow. The guards shook from fear of him and became like dead men. And then the angel said to the women, hold on, before we get any farther. This has no basis in scripture whatsoever. But if I were those ladies and saw these angels show up, I would have been like, where were you three days ago? I would have been, I would have been angry, to be honest. Will you show up now? He's dead. You could have done something before. Why now? You see, I think so often we think in the moment they all understood, but they didn't. They didn't understand the majesty of what was happening, the power of what was happening. Now we can look at what he says. And the angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who has been crucified, he is not here. For he is risen, just as he said. Amen. Why are you looking for the living among the dead? All right, here we go. He is risen. He is risen. One more time for the slow people. He is risen. He is risen. Amen. Jesus' resurrection means our victory. Our victory over death and pain, suffering, the eternal victory. Jesus wasn't done. And we give thanks to God for he has given us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. 
For he has rescued us from the dominance of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son, into light. We have been redeemed. We have been forgiven. Amen. Jesus looked through the anguish of the cross. He looked through it. That's why this series is called Cross Equals Love. That's why this has been up here this whole time. The cross is a torture device. It's a shame device. It's a pain device. It's a power device. How could it equal love? Only if something miraculous happened where Jesus flips the script and says, no, this is now a sacrifice of my love for you and nothing can separate us from the love of Jesus Christ for us. Jesus' dying wasn't the end. It was the beginning of his victory that continues through his resurrection, ascension, return, and into eternity. Following him, too, is the beginning of your victory, is the beginning of hope in your life. And no matter what comes, no matter what comes, Jesus Christ is with you. You will never be forsaken. Jesus Christ's victory continues through you as well. He has called you to be a messenger of love and to work that work of love on the cross out in fear, (laughs) not in a fear of getting it wrong, but in awe of who God is. So what I want to change that century-old tradition of that call and response just a little bit, okay? As we finish here, I, I want to change it just a bit. Instead of saying, he is risen, he is risen indeed, which is good. Let's preach to each other about that. That's a good thing. Instead, I I want us to kind of turn to what God is going to do in and through us and instead say he is risen and then you say, we rise with him. We rise with him because that's the hope of Easter. The resurrection wasn't just something that happened that was cool. It was something that means there's victory in our lives, no matter what brokenness, no matter what happened, no matter if your electric scooter got stolen this morning, you had to walk. That happened to someone. And they came, and he had just the most beautiful smile on his face because he understands what Easter is. No matter what you came in here with today, I want you to leave with hope that God has got you. So we're going to practice that. We will rise with him is your response. So he is risen. That was pretty good first. I'll give you one more time. He is risen. That's good. Hope rises in our hearts. Despite the realities of pain and suffering in our lives, hope not in our ability, but in his victory. And we remember who we are in Jesus on Easter. And we shout it. We get excited about it. We remember what he purchased with his death and how he calls us to walk in victory in this life. In a moment, I'll ask you to stand, not yet. But I want to read some things I prepared, some statements. I don't want it to wash over you, and I want something to burn inside of you, something to change as we declare together who he is. So, what's up, bud? How you doing, Q? He's okay. It's okay. You're all good. Hey, I love, that was the cutest thing in the world. My gosh, I love having children in here. I'm serious. I'm serious. This is a good thing. Mm. All right. Came at the right time, right before I started. So here we go. You, you are a new creation with a new calling. No longer condemned, but a citizen of a new community of Christ and his church. And you can and should celebrate what he has done. You have been justified, rectified, purified, and it cannot be denied. You've been adopted into a magnificent eternal family. A family of every skin color, every language and song, with millions of choruses about the goodness of our God. A family that overcomes oppression dysfunction, bigotry, hatred, rage, and malice. You are no longer dominated by sin 
or any earthly power, for shame and uncertainty have been crucified on a cross 2,000 years ago. And that moment shoots through to your heart and to your family and to your world right now. You are free. Mercy and grace are now closer than a brother or sister. If mercy is not getting what you deserve and grace is getting what you could never deserve, then the only logical outcome of Jesus Christ's sacrifice is this. You are loved. You are cherished. You are pursued. You are accepted. And God delights in you. You've been given a new name. You have been sealed in the spirit of God. You've been set aside with a purpose. You have been sent into the world to bring the joy of the Lord, which will be your strength. You have a new purpose, you masterpiece. We have been reclaimed, redeemed, reinvigorated by Christ Jesus to be righteous and give him glory. He is risen. Yes. He is risen and we will rise with him. So stand up. Stand up with purpose. Stand up with hope. Stand up and leave shame in your seat. Almost said a different word. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. For now there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. So one more time, your response is, we will rise with him. He is risen. We will rise with him. Jesus is always doing more than you can imagine. Always. So as we sing this song again, I want to remind you of this bridge part. And even if you don't quite get it, right? Just sing it out. But our response to Easter is that we won't be quiet. We'll sing out your praise. You are exalted for the price that you paid. We won't and can't deny it. Our bones, they burn inside of us. Our voice is rising, shouting, victory is your name. Shouting, victory is your name. Shouting victory is 
to lift your voice for the price that you paid. We can't deny our bones, they burn inside us. Our voices rise. We're shouting, victory is your name. Yeah, we are. We're shouting, we're shouting, victory is your name. Pray that God's peace and joy and victory fill your heart to the fullness. I pray that you go with excitement and joy, that you go with the love of Jesus. The prayer team's gonna be up here. If you made a decision to follow Jesus, come receive prayer. If you have something on your heart, come receive prayer. If you just need to share with something excitement, come and receive prayer. As you go, if you are new, please fill this out. On the way out, there are shirts just like this that have been purchased for you. We'd love to say hi to you if this is your first time. Fill this out. Come back next week. We're starting a series about how everybody gets to play. Everyone gets to be part of what God is doing in this world. We'll see you very, very soon. Happy Easter.